So since starting my Cenozoic segment, the dinosaurs have taken somewhat of a back foot, but I want to show the dinos some love and get my fix. So let's take a look at what is possibly the biggest flying dinosaur that we know of. Paleontologist Kenneth Campbell and Eduardo Tony first described this animal back in 1980 when they found material of a skull, humerus, coracoid and toe within the Epicoan formation of Argentina. They noticed, despite the damage of the remains, that these bones clearly belonged to a member of the Teratornidae, which were very large raptorial or predatory birds closely related to today's vultures. But these remains most certainly didn't belong to any known extinct animal at the time. So they elected to name it as a new genus and species, Argentavus magnificens. Later down the line, other specimens of this bird were found within the similarly aged Andaluala formation. Now this bird is relatively well known at this point, partly because of its association as being one of the many creatures in ARC, but mostly because paleontologists have estimated this thing to be the largest flying bird to ever exist. And yes, I know there's going to be some debate. What is size? What about this other animal? Ryan, you're a complete fucking idiot and evolution isn't even real. But just to be clear, when we talk about size, we're normally referring to what's the heaviest, which does correlate with visual size. Now, Argentavus has been outdone by a fraction by Pelagornis in terms of wingspan. But that thing's a spindly loser, so Argentavus is still biggest overall. How big, I hear you ask. Well, given the fragmentary remains, size estimates do vary since different scaling methods have been used. We know that the humerus alone was around the length of the average human man's entire arm, and given the proportions of other pterotorns, Argentavis's wingspan has been estimated to have been between 5 to 7 metres, or 16.4 to 23 feet, with an overall length of around 3.5 metres, or 11 foot 6, a standing height of 1.5 to 1.8 metres, or 4 foot 11 to 5 foot 11, and a weight estimate of between 70 to 80 kilograms, or 154 to 180 pounds. Now the closest living analogue that we have in terms of size and close relation to Argentavis is the Andean condor, which are bloody huge birds, but still only having just under half the wingspan of Argentavis. So with those kind of sizes, that's brought into question how the hell this thing even flew. But before we get into that, let's take a look at Argentavis's environment. As already mentioned, Argentavis has been found in the Epiquen and Andaluala formations, which are Miocene in age, being deposited between 9 to 6.8 million years ago. The area at the time was not one quite as rich in thick forests, instead showing Aeolian deposits, which are sedimentary structures caused by wind currents as opposed to aquatic, meaning that much of the area was relatively dry and open. Fluvial deposits were also found in some places, meaning that river and stream systems were present, as well as some volcanic deposits. In short, this area wasn't too far from many of the natural landscapes that we see in Argentina today. Occupying this formation alongside Argentavis were other avian dinosaurs, such as the infamous terror birds that were so prevalent in South America at the time. We also see smaller reptiles, like Tupinambus, and various turtles, as well as amphibians such as Lepida batrachus, and the dominating vertebrates, mammals. These include various marsupials, from palsy tuberculates, polydilopomorphs, and opossums. Undulates, such as Macraucania, and Pseudotypotherium, along with various armadillos, ground sloths, and their relatives. Mammalian predators from this area include carnivorans such as Cyanosaur and some Sporacidonts, which were marsupial relatives that heavily resembled groups such as large cats, with an example being the strangely jawed Thylacosmilus. So where did Argentavis fit into all of this? Well, as a flying raptor, it's estimated that this giant bird had a territorial range of around 200 square miles, but it's been heavily questioned whether this was even a predator. Now, large flying animals of this magnitude aren't really built for aerial hunting due to just the sheer size and how that would affect aerodynamics, which only leaves hunting on the ground. Problem here is that there were already a group of birds that were much better at ground dwelling predation in the terror birds. So much better, in fact, that they were the apex predators of the region. But on the other hand, Argentavis had the features of a typical pteratorn that seemed ideal for hunting such as the more eagle-like beaks and a skull structure that suggests it would swallow things whole like owls rather than tearing flesh. Likeliest answer here is that it was a 50-50 split. It likely followed the smaller metatherian mammals during a hunt and bullied them away from all their hard work, as well as hunting smaller animals such as large rodents or the young of ground sloths on the ground, just keeping out of the way of the terror birds. 
The other question normally raised when it comes to flying animals of this kind of size is to what extent did it actually fly and how? Well, given the more open plains, it probably took to the air more often than, say, giant Asjarkids. As I mentioned in my Quetzalcoatlus video, flying animals of this size depend more on winds and other thermal air currents to stay aloft, rather than using powered flapping as much. But many Asjarkids occupied much denser environments, so weren't as exposed to winds. Argentavis, on the other hand, could combine these air currents prevalent in the plains and these sloping terrains to take off and stay in the air, only relying on flapping its wings in very short sporadic bursts. Now sizes of this magnitude is normally a pretty big issue when it comes to flying animals, but it seems that Argentavis got a pretty good balance. This bird didn't seem to have large numbers of young in one go, laying maybe one to two eggs every couple of years. Now the fact that Argentavis sustained a population like this seems to suggest that the infant mortality rate was surprisingly low. These nests were likely in some very hard to reach places whilst they were being cared for by the adults. And by the time the chicks left the nest, they were already big enough for most animals to not want to mess with and able to fly away from the very few animals that did. As a result, it's likely that not much killed Argentavis other than disease or old age. And just to disappoint the ARC fans out there, no you could not ride it. It had a hard enough time getting up into the air without some lardy human parking its sweaty balls in its back. But other than that crushing disappointment, what did you think of this look into Argentavis? Tell all down in the comments, and if you'd like me to look further into any more flying giants, be sure to let me know as well. Catch you guys next time.